All right, well, my editing skills are crap. But can the same thing be said about, uh, what is this? A wrinkle in time. Stick around and find out. Sweet dreams are made of these. Who am I to disagree? I've traveled the world and the seven seas. Uh, hi. I'm Peter Franson from ChristianGeekCentral.com and Spirit Blade Productions. This is my uncut review of A Wrinkle in Time. Uh, now, I have not read the, uh, the the book that this was based on. I gave it a try back in, uh, in junior high, found it to be too dry and, uh, I guess, not character-driven enough. And, you know, just kind of all about concepts rather than characters. I tend to gravitate more towards stories that have to do with characters rather than concepts. So, uh, But uh, let me give you my thoughts on what this movie was to me. The synopsis on IMDb reads, Following the discovery of a new form of space travel, as well as Meg's father's disappearance, she, her brother, and her friend must join three magical beings, Mrs. What's-It, Mrs. Who, and Mrs. Which, to travel across the universe to rescue him from a terrible evil. All right, so if there's a spectrum... Of movies where you've got like kid movie and then transition to family movie and then you transition to adult movie um, this one felt mostly like a kids movie I was hoping it would be more of like a family movie type thing and maybe that is kind of what they were going for I'm not sure but to me it felt largely like a kids movie you know that that's the adventure in this movie is largely based around a sense of wondrous spectacle not a real sense of peril, I don't think. At least I didn't feel real peril. I think maybe in the back half or the final third, they're definitely going for peril. But by that point, I don't know, maybe just because of, you know, in a meta sense, because of the PG rating, I was like, ah, nothing really bad. So we're not going to see any blood. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, um, Although for young kids, I would imagine it will, it will s s feel uh, exciting enough. But for me, I was largely bored. The kids are also written as older than they are, which I think is another kind of indication that this is for kids, uh, rather than a movie that's for adults, where kids are often written to be more like kids actually are, you know, rather than kind of empowering them. I think that's kind of what, what happens in a kid's movie, is, we, is kids want to feel empowered when they're watching kids in movies, you know, so they, they empower the kids, they make them smarter, more capable. Um, and the fact that they were smarter and more capable in this movie was explained a bit by uh, the unusual brilliance of two of them, because they are the son and daughter of this really brilliant couple. Um, but that intelligence aside, and with the other kid that was with them, they still behave and talk in what felt like very scripty kind of ways, if that makes sense, um, or romanticized ways that, that might appeal to kids again, but I don't think realistically represent kids. There were a few moments of drama that moved me, though. Uh, any scene Chris Pine was in felt more grounded and real to me. I think that's both because of the script in those moments and how long they spent on certain things, certain emotional beats, um, and also because of the actor's performances. Uh, Chris Pine plays the father, and I thought he did a great job of, of reminding me of some very relatable emotional realities uh, in the midst of very unrelatable uh, circumstances and psychological behaviors in the rest of the movie. Uh, let's see here. Now, I have to confess regarding just the, my thoughts on the casting in this movie. There's some bias on my part going in. Uh, I think Oprah Winfrey can do some fine acting. I've definitely seen that in her before. But a number of her philosophical uh, views regarding spiritual matters, which she used her talk show to perpetuate for years, are broken and actually harmful. And since her character in this movie was also a mouthpiece for expressing some of those same views, the real world kind of intruded a bit in ways that didn't help my viewing experience. Um, that doesn't always happen with me, you know, I mean, there's some actors that, you know, have like, they're crazy outspoken in and, and have, you know, beliefs that I would like have major concerns about, like say Tom Cruise, but for some reason when I'm watching a Tom Cruise movie, I don't know, I, I don't, I'm not thinking about his belief in, you know, Scientology, uh, but... For some reason, Oprah Winfrey, at least in this movie, was uh, bringing some baggage with her for me. Um, I'm also not a fan of Mindy Kaling, if that's how you pronounce her last name. As an actress, I should specify, her performances to me in the few things that I've seen her in, I haven't seen her in much, just like maybe The Office and one other show, one or two other things. 
Um, but you know, in the few things I have seen her in, her performances read to me as as one dimensional, and uh, and I didn't see a change of course here. She was just kind of a, a smiling mouthpiece for a bunch of quotes, largely in this movie, and I'll, I'll comment on that uh, a little bit later. Um, as far as stunts and visuals, I'm going to say almost nothing about them. Lots of CG that looks like CG. Um, I think it's especially for a kids movie that's not going to be uh, that's not going to be a problem. Um, all right, let's talk about relevance. Is there anything of moral, philosophical, or spiritual significance going on here that might trigger worthwhile thought or conversation? Um, I think there's a good shot of that. It certainly triggered some thoughts uh, in my mind. Despite being a movie that largely seems uh, meant for kids, it also seems like it's wanting to say a number of things, philosophically speaking, that would go over kids' heads, I think. Uh, familiar pop spiritual phrases and ideas repeatedly show up in this movie, such as, have faith in who you are. You know, that's that's a solution. you got to, like, just go, go to it, girl, and have faith in who you are. Uh, you are a part of the universe. Um, becoming one with the universe is kind of an ideal presented briefly in this movie. But none of these ideas are really examined or subjected to any questioning in the story. They aren't even explained in any detail. And that's, you know, I, I don't know of any movie that really does explain these slogans and, you know, phrases in detail. Uh, in fact, annoyingly to me, one character's dialogue, as I mentioned before, Mindy Kaling's character, is made up almost entirely of quotes from famous people throughout history taken out of context context with no clear explanation of how they apply to the current scene. I think you can infer, you know, from context, but it's still just one more example of we're just going to throw some things out there and we're not going to explain specifically what we mean as writers by using this phrase here, you know. Uh, I think this approach to expressing belief is largely done, uh, this is a speculation on my part, but I think it's largely done because it conveniently dodges a need to defend anything. If you don't clearly state your position on an issue, then you don't have to potentially defend your position. Um, but I would love for movies like this to better explain and defend these slogans that they use. I mean, what does it mean to have faith in who I am if I'm a selfish jerk, should everyone just have faith in who they are? I, I don't know. Uh, what does it mean to be a part of the universe? Um, and why would I want to become one with the universe? I mean, I just watched Annihilation not long ago, and becoming one with the universe didn't look so good in that movie. It looked horrific. Uh, but these phrases and slogans are almost never examined when presented in entertainment. They, they just sound kind of nice. They sound, on the surface, maybe profound, because maybe because we don't know what they're quite getting at, and so we assume there's something deep and well and thoroughly thought out behind this surface quote, but once we press them for clarity or examine their assumptions and implications, at that point they just fall apart. Um, evil gets an interesting treatment in this movie. As in a number of other fantasy stories that I've uh, read or seen, evil is personified. Uh, it's a giant it. In, in this movie, evil is called evil, and it's an it. And it's also revealed later in passing to be the most evil mind in the universe. So it is a person, a literal person in this movie. Uh, and worth noting, it is external to humans. It's not coming from them, but externally it's manipulating and victimizing them. Now this approach has, you know, some metaphoric value, but we should readily acknowledge that we are evil at times, and we ultimately choose the evil we take part in. Um, we are responsible for the evil we do. Now we may be victims of the evil of others, but we are not merely victims of evil. We are perpetrators as well, and so we need a cure that is external to us, something that is pure and reliable and that cannot be, that, that, that cannot fail, um, that can then change who we are. But in this movie, people are the supposed cure to evil. People who, you know, as we know in real life, are the perpetrators of evil itself, but for some reason there's, uh, people are supposed to be able to cure and destroy and defeat evil in this movie. Um, in this movie, we are the warriors capable of defeating evil. There is no single personified representation of ultimate good in this movie. Ultimate evil is personified, or evil in general, and all the evil in the universe is this one being that's external to us, and we're just kind of its victims. Uh, but there's no 
there's no personification of ultimate good. Ultimate good is nowhere to be found compared to this clear presentation of a singular personified evil. Biblically speaking, evil is not actually a quote-unquote thing, and it's certainly not a person. Evil is a, is a diversion from that which is good. It's a twisting of that which is pure. It's a, a falling short of perfection. The Hebrew word for sin means to miss the mark. Evil and sin are not these things. They're not entities, strictly speaking. They're conditions created by choice. But even human faults in this movie are not only excused, but kind of propped up as good in some way. It's really weird to me. The, the key to victory in the climax of this movie is the hero's recognition of her own faults. But in the aftermath, a mouthpiece of wisdom calls those faults beautiful. Beautiful. Oh, your beautiful faults. Um, I'm like, what? What do you mean by that? At the same time, in a touching moment near the end, the father apologizes for something he had done that caused others a lot of pain for a long time. Was that fault of his beautiful too? Another point of inconsistent messaging uh, comes when a character tells our hero, it's okay to be afraid of the answers, but we can't avoid them. Now this was actually a great truth that we all need to apply. Uh, first, of course, I'd love the writers responsible for the empty spiritual slogans in this movie to ask some hard questions of the ideas propped up here and not avoid the unpleasant answers to those hard questions. But we as Christians need to ask ourselves the same questions about our own slogans and phrases and, and about their assumptions and implications. Uh, we all need to be prepared to examine and re-examine those doctrines we've embraced and see if they couldn't be improved through either, scary thought, abandonment, or at the very least, refinement. If we, I believe that if we haven't changed our minds or gained a more nuanced understanding of something we believe in the last few years, I think there's a good chance we aren't asking ourselves hard enough questions or certainly pursuing deeper understanding. Um, let me say that again. I know that there's probably some that will disagree, but uh, if we haven't changed our minds or gained a more nuanced understanding of something we believe in the last few years, I think there's a good chance we aren't asking ourselves hard enough questions. Um, one moment that will serve as a positive takeaway for me is when the father apologizes to his daughter for creating the experiment that separated him from his family for four years. He said, and this brought tears to my eyes, he said, I wanted to shake the universe's hand and I should have been holding yours. Um, and that hit me really hard as a dad who works for himself and has a lot of control over when I work and how much I work. Moments like these are convicting reminders that my ambition is not worth missing out on my kids growing up. Um, and I think this doesn't just apply to people who work for themselves because ultimately we, we all choose um, what job we have, you know, unless that we are absolutely at the end of our rope and we have no other choices. I think most of us are in a position where we, we could choose to take a crappier job if that will allow us to spend more time with our families if we really need to, you know. Um, and so I think that there, that choice is present for us much more often than we're, than we're willing to face it, you know. Um, and again, certainly for, for me and, and other parents like me who have uh, a lot more control over how often they work, when they work, things like that, um, I think this could be a really good just reminder to us. These are precious years for me. I have two young boys and I don't want to miss them growing up. Um, it's great timing for me as we head into spring break this coming week in our home and I'll have some choices to make next week about how to spend my time while my boys are around the house more often. All right, well, I have no idea what your tastes are in movies, but if I were a time traveler, I would go back in time and say, Peter, hey, skip this one. This is not your kind of movie. Too much of a kid's movie with a slow pace, little sense of danger, and empty philosophy. Uh, there are a couple moments that will be tear jerkers for you, but, you know, instead, I mean, th those moments being so brief, just look for that Folgers commercial where Peter comes home for Christmas. He's on YouTube. And, and then remind yourself <laughs> to carve out some time uh, for your boys this week. That'll save you both time and money. Uh, all right, it's rated PG third, or no, PG, PG for thematic elements and some peril. 
All right, those are my thoughts. I'd love to get yours in the comments below. Uh, if you want to like, share, and subscribe, that is a nice way to, uh, to help out our channel here. And uh, you can also support this channel by becoming a Spirit Blade Insider, which grants you exclusive monthly behind-the-scenes content. For more info, you can visit our About page over at spiritblade.com, where, where you will also find excuse me, our audio dramas and our weekly podcast. And finally, of course, there's a ton more content and community over at christiangeekcentral.com. So I hope you join us over there soon as we continue to geek out and seek the truth. Hey, just a reminder that this humble little YouTube channel is so dependent on uh, people just like you. There are three main ways you can support this channel, and they're all over at spiritblade.com. The first is to purchase one of our sci-fi or fantasy audio dramas. Second is to give us a donation of any amount. And third, you can become a Spirit Blade Insider and get access to exclusive behind-the-scenes monthly goodies. You can get more information on our About page over at spiritblade.com. Thanks so much.